Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining in another week. Have a great show planned for you. Later on, I'll have with me Marshall County Commissioner, former West Virginia delegate Mike Farrell will be talking about a number of things, including the work stoppage with the West Virginia teachers this week and things happening in Marshall County. But first, we'll start with some of our usual features, and we have to start with that work stoppage that's taken that has taken place in West Virginia this week with respect to the teachers and the school service personnel. Second year in a row that there's been a work stoppage. You know, last week I had Jenny Craig on the show, president of the Ohio County Education Association, and you know, we knew that this was a possibility and I guess my timing was good in having her on the show, but didn't know that this would particularly happen this week, but it did. And, you know, worth talking about why, of course, Senate Bill 451, which was referred to as the omnibus education bill, was kind of just run rough, roughshod over everybody in the Senate. Um, you know, just kind of remind everyone a little bit. Um, this was the education bill that came out of the Senate Education Committee, but then was bypassed the Senate Finance Committee in a very uh, strange and unusual move. Instead, the Senate president went to the Committee of the Whole, something that had only been used a couple of times in West Virginia history. The thought being that the votes weren't there necessarily in the Senate Finance Committee uh, in order to get this bill to move forward, so instead used the, the Committee of the Whole, thinking that he would have the votes among the entire Senate, which he did, uh, and this, the, the, the bill passed in the Senate, and then went to the House. And in the House of Delegates, a number of amendments made to the Senate version of the bill and then sent back to the Senate where basically they just said, ah, forget you House, we're not talking about these things and in fact we're going to go and in increase some of the stuff that we did. We're going to increase the number of charter schools and things of that nature. Um, when that happened, uh, that's when the teachers took action and of course two days this week we're out of school with the work stoppage. The bill went back to the House uh, and it was voted, uh, you know, with a number of Republicans, 12 Republicans joining the Democrats uh, in voting to basically indefinitely put the bill on hold. Uh, kind of one of the worst things that can happen to a bill because uh, it makes it tough to bring it back up. Um, so, you know, the bill permanently put on hold uh, and that caused the teachers after 24 hours waiting to see that there wasn't a motion to reconsider or anything like that and that didn't happen. They then go back to school. Uh, this week and the schools open back up. So, you know, interesting, uh, some interesting moves there all around. And, you know, some other things happening as well of interest. You know, one of our local delegates, Delegate McGeehan from uh, Hancock County, removed this week by Speaker of the House Hanshaw from the House Judiciary Committee the day after he voted with the Democrats. Now, McGeehan's a Republican, remember that. He voted with the Democrats with respect to the education bill. The very next day, He's removed from the House Judiciary Committee, a rather strange uh, and unusual move in the middle of, uh, you know, the middle of the uh, session to remove someone from a committee. But that happened, uh, and it appears, you know, from uh, outsiders to be probably in retaliation for his for his vote. And uh, he's been outspoken on some other things. He doesn't always go with his party on things. So uh, some unusual happenings down there in the Senate and now in the House as well. And you know. We'll be talking about those things later on with my guest, Mike Farrow, uh, who was in the House of Delegates for a number of years, but just not some things that you typically see. But what you have seen is, once again, uh, the teachers showing their force in Charleston and throughout the state to see to it that the things that they don't feel should be happening aren't happening and the things they do believe should be happening do happen. That leads me to a quote this week uh, that I want to give you, and this one comes from Kevin O'Leary. Uh, you may know him, know him better as Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. Uh, you know the. Uh, very popular TV series, and here's what he said. He said, unions are about the collective leverage, the power of numbers versus the power of capital. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, um, when you look at who is really trying to get this omnibus education bill through, a lot of it has to do with out-of-state interests with a lot of money, uh, organizations like ALEC and others that want to see these things done because things like charter schools can allow money to be funneled to private interests and things of that nature that are supporting some of these individuals. So, you know, there, there's a lot of money being pushed to try to get things like this through our legislature and unions really are about the power of numbers versus the power of money and in this particular instance and in, in last year as well, I think the teachers were able to show that numbers mean something. That there can be strength in numbers if they all stick together and they're all, they all act in unity then they can make a difference and combat that money. But really, that's about the only way to do it, is if people stick together and there are a lot of numbers. And you, know, you have that with respect to the teachers, fortunately. Uh, unfortunately, with respect to some of the other laws that out-of-state interests have interest in, 
there's really not those same numbers to combat it. There's nobody there fighting for some of these other things because it doesn't affect this big collective group as a whole, but it affects oftentimes everyone, but it's just people don't realize it because they don't have an immediate vested interest in whatever the subject matter may be, like the teachers do with respect to the education system. So that's really what it's been all about is numbers versus money. And we've seen two years in a row here where numbers have prevailed, uh, but the money's going to keep on coming. You can be assured of that. I also want to give you a legal tip this week that's related. And, you know, people have asked a lot, you know, what's the difference between a work stoppage and a strike? You know, what, what does that mean? One, what's a work stoppage? What's a strike? Um, and, and here's basically what it is. First of all, Striking is actually illegal in the state of West Virginia. It's illegal for teachers to strike. It's illegal for public uh, employees to strike. Uh, but these haven't been strikes. These have been work stoppages. And the difference is that the county superintendents in each of the counties basically have said, we are not going to have school. When they've heard that the teachers weren't going to be there, they closed the schools, which means that there wasn't a school day with pupils there or whatever, or an open school day where teachers weren't showing up to work. So it's technically not a strike because the schools are closed. So it's a work stoppage. So if the schools have been left open, if the county superintendents weren't supporting their teachers, if they weren't uh, going to leave the schools uh, closed and said they were saying, we're going to be open, then it would be a strike if the teachers didn't show up, um, which is illegal. So that's kind of the difference, just to explain it there, a uh, little legal tip there. And, uh, you know, it makes it very difficult if the schools um, had been open, uh, then it gets really, really contentious where you start seeing some teachers go in, some don't, some cross the picket line. There starts being, you know, battles between some if they're not. If there are some that are, you know, going to cross the picket line, uh, fortunately, uh, we didn't have that situation and the county superintendents, I think, were wise to close the schools because you don't want to see teachers pitted against teachers that, you know, are maybe in the same departments or have to work together or maybe coach together or whatever it may be. Uh, I think it's good to have that unity and everybody be on the same page there. So glad to see that the uh, superintendents did close the schools so it would be a work stoppage. We need to take a break. When I come back, I'll have my guest, County Commissioner Mike Farrow with me. Stay with us here on the Jamie Bordas Show. When reviewing your oil and gas offers or royalty check statements, do you wonder, am I being offered a fair amount? Do I feel comfortable reading the statement? Do I have peace of mind? If you answered no to these questions, you need Bordas Mineral Management. Our passion is helping mineral owners protect and expand their mineral wealth. Our examiners tell you whether you're being treated fairly and getting paid what is rightfully yours. Bordas Mineral Management, be protected, have peace of mind, Recommended by the highest authorities. Danoon Lumber. It's like a bad one's coming. Yeah. Right? Welcome back to the show. This is my favorite time each week when I have a guest with me, and this week's no different. I have with me Marshall County Commissioner Mike Farrow, former member of the House of Delegates out of Marshall County, longtime teacher, longtime coach in Marshall County, and now uh, in a new position, but we'll maybe talk a little about his old position first, but uh, Commissioner, thanks for being here on the show. Thank you for having me, Jamie. You know, uh, we'll talk a lot about uh, Marshall County and your new role as commission maybe after we take a break, but I first want to talk about where I kind of left off here before the break, which is, you know, the work stoppage. I mean, obviously, uh, you're very tuned into that, having been a longtime uh, teacher, educator, uh, coach in Marshall County, and then a member of the House of Delegates. A uh, lot of happenings here. Exactly. And, and, uh, and I've been very involved in this, Jamie. Uh, as a longtime teacher, 35-year teacher, 40-year coach, this profession means a lot to me. And um, what had appeared with that Senate omnibus bill, which I had told our teachers and, and uh, service personnel back in August that they're going to try to buy your souls with 30 pieces of silver, but they're going to Christmas tree this bill up. They're going to take away everything that you've ever fought for away. Uh, I just didn't think it was going to be that bad. And it certainly was. It was actually worse than, than I, I anticipated. And it was all, all generated in the Senate. And it, it, to me, it was generated um, as a vendetta against teachers and service personnel by Senate President Mitch Carmichael and people that, uh, that they thought they were embarrassed by what the teachers had done last year. And um, you can see what, what Mitch tried to do by putting in charter schools, uh, educational savings accounts, um, trying to, um, uh, to, to, to take a seniority away in RIF and transfer, trying to payroll protection, when it had nothing to do 
with, uh, with education, re education reform. And, uh, you know, they use that word flexibility. And I can tell you, since the Republican takeover, whenever they use the word flexibility, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> I can tell you that. You got this uh, ribbon here. You know, you were in the House last year yes. during the last year's work stoppage, and uh, you were given this by, I guess, uh, a number of groups here. It says WBEA on the pin, but there's three ribbons here. What, what's this? Yeah, the, the uh, pin actually here? is uh, when I started teaching in 1974. It's from 1974 when I, I became a member of WBEA. But this basically allowed us to have a, a hall pass. We were the good guys, okay? Red was uh, supporting teachers, yellow was supporting service personnel, and blue was supporting state, uh, state employees, other public employees. And when we walked the halls with the masses of people that were there, Last year, um, you know, they, they thanked us for what we were trying to do for them. It was kind of smart of them to do that, not just kind of very smart for them to do that. And you know, the, the folks that were supporting uh, the teachers, the school service personnel, the public employees kind of became, for lack of a better word, in some ways rock stars down there. I mean, you got all this chanting and going on and thousands of people and stuff, and you're walking through just like, a, you know, somebody would be at a concert almost. It's kind of, it got wild. I likened it to Woodstock last year. One, yeah. the, the one day when the, the Capitol itself, the rotunda and downstairs and everything, it was filled up. Then when you looked outside and out the windows and all the way around the Capitol complex, it was ringed with supporters of public education. I mean, it, it gave you goosebumps. Uh, it, was, it was just entirely thrilling to see that many people come out and to fight for their own, uh, their own livelihoods. You know, we are teachers and, 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 and teaching kids is our, our job, but we still have our own livelihoods. We have our own families to take care of. And um, we want to protect our professions as best we can. You know, there were some gains made in the, in the election uh, in the fall of 2018, some pro-education folks being elected, both in the Senate and the House. Uh, but the Republicans still, you know, maintained uh, the majority in both houses. And, you know, I kind of thought after last year and what they saw happen in the election, they think, well, we better hold our horses here a little bit. But... Instead, they kind of doubled down here um, and said, you know, we're going to go even harder, maybe with this year not being an election year and thinking maybe by next year people will forget, things like that. But were, were you surprised to, to see it happen this way? No, I really wasn't surprised. Uh, I, I, the, to the severity of it, I was surprised. Okay, but I wasn't surprised at all. I thought they would do this. The, the, in the Senate, the Republicans hold a 20 to 14 edge. And you alluded to it earlier that um, it, that went through the Senate Education Committee then it was supposed to go to Senate Finance, which it would have gotten defeated in Senate Finance. The two Republicans who actually voted no on that bill uh, were in Senate Finance that would have killed it. There were 10 Republicans, seven, seven Democrats in Senate Finance. The, the flipping of those two would have made it 9-8. It would have killed the bill. So what they did was they used uh, that uh, little used um, uh, the tactic uh, committee as a whole, took it down to the floor, and they said they were going to vet it properly in a committee as the whole. What they didn't do though, Jamie, was they never consulted with this bill. They never consulted any of the teacher groups, any of the state superintendents, any of the, of the uh, uh, school boards, uh, local school boards or state school board association, never included them in any of their talks and actually wouldn't let them speak on the House floor. But they brought in representatives of ALEC, of the uh, Cardinal Institute, of the, of the uh, Charter Schools Associations and things like that. And if you remember, Mitch Carmichael kept saying they're playing to their special interests, the educators, okay, to the unions, AFT, WVEA, WVSSPA, service personnel. Uh, but also we had, you know, as I said, the state superintendents, state school boards, and all of those people and all of the teachers pay taxes in West Virginia. They're all West Virginia taxpayers. We're never consulted about this bill. But he didn't talk about his special interest, ALEC, the... Cardinal Institute, Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers, and on and on and on, who spend zero dollars, zero tax dollars in West Virginia. So why were we catering to these outside interests? What was the hook for that? Why were they trying to do that? When somebody, the teachers, in fact, you saw it in mass, they said, we don't want this. And we're willing to forego any raise that's in there to protect our, our, our uh, profession. How you know, unusual is it, based upon your years in the legislature, to see, you know, there not be hearings on something, there not be people that have a vested interest coming in and speaking to something about a bill? You know, it seems like if there's if there's a topic, you would want to talk to the people that really are involved with that topic every day. It's an absolute sham. I've I've never really seen that tactic used, um, and I've never seen the committee as a whole used. 
when I was down there. In fact, I think uh, it's only been used two or three times in West Virginia history, dating back to uh, 1863. Yeah, pretty unbelievable. It is. We need to take a break. When we come back, I'll continue speaking with Marshall County Commissioner Mike Farrow about things happening in Marshall County and his new job there as a commissioner. Stay with us here on The Jamie Bordas Show. help you save it. Belmont Savings Bank. Focused on your future. So, how was your first day? Oh, long. So, Josh asked me about you. Daddy's home. Go get him. For your home, for your life, for more than 50 years. The Hardwood Specialists, the Noon Lumber. Welcome back to the show. I've been speaking with my guest this week, Marshall County Commissioner Mike Farrow. We've been talking about some of the happenings in the legislature that he used to be a part of, but now uh, a Marshall County Commissioner and uh, new job for you here. and. Uh, it's got to be a, a lot of change and some uh, things to learn. And uh, what have you seen so far? It is, it is, Jamie. It's exciting uh, to me. Uh, you know, as a member of the House of Delegates for 10 years, I had made a decision um, to run for county commissioner uh, simply because you, you only get a chance every six years in your district. And, and I had made that decision just simply because I could stay home and, and perhaps focus all my attention on things that were going on in Marshall County. And uh, because I'm a Marshall County guy and uh, and uh, want to try to do the best I can for, for the county. You know, in terms of the job, um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's political, but it's different. Um, you know, in, in the state, you're down there with uh, uh, 25 people on committees that you deal with every day. There, you have committee work, and then you deal with 100 in, in, the, in, in the, uh, the assembly, you know, in the House. Uh, but in the commission, you deal with two other guys, okay? And there are just three of you up there that make decisions. Uh, based on financially financial decisions uh, of the county and uh, just learning the format of what to do has been not the hardest thing but it's just something that i've had to learn and, and i think I'm, I'm getting more comfortable an, an interesting time to, to be a commissioner in marshall county because so much activity with the oil and gas industry something that you know you go back a decade ago you wouldn't have seen but a, lo a lot of uh, you know things happening in marshall county and uh, so it's got to be a, a, a big time to be there. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, with, uh, and, and of course, I was in the house when uh, oil and gas, they, you know, they came marching in 10 years ago. And, um, you know, with progress comes, uh, comes hardship, too. And uh, obviously, there's been an influx of, um, of, of, of money into Marshall County, you know, in housing and restaurants and things of that nature. But also, the, you know, the hardships are on the roads and the traffic involved, you know, with all the traffic uh, with the, with the construction in Moundsville right now too, with them replacing the bridges down there, um, the traffic has been the, the, has been incredible, and the, the potholes in Marshall County, Jamie, it's it, it's just massive there. Plus, we were we were told also by the Department of Highways we have over 700 slips in Marshall County. Wow. Yeah. You know, people may not realize, but as a county commissioner, you, you can fight for the county, you know, to, by talking to others, but you really can't do anything about it as a commission. No, we can't. Uh, that is not under our purview. And um, um, in fact, uh, you know, I told people that when you were a delegate, um, and I would deal with people a lot, okay, and I, I worked very, very arduously with people with, uh, with road conditions, and, um, and I had some contacts with the Department of Highways, but we, we were not able to tell the Department of Highways what to do. We worked with them. Again, they are under the purview of the governor, and um, they make the decisions based on that. But as a commission, we take down all the concerns that people give us, and we will still call the Department of Highways and let them know what is going on, but we have no say-so in what they do. You know, speaking of the oil and gas industry, there's been a lot of talk about a potential cracker right across the, the river and, and in Ohio, and uh, that would have an economic impact on Marshall County as well, I think. And uh, you know, how are you all looking at that and trying to position Marshall County well if that does happen? Well, you know, we, we have um, our regional economic development people, you know, Red 
the Red P, Red Partnership, and uh, they're the ones that do the economic development in Marshall County, and they've been um, um, been talking to a lot of different companies, and they also have those non-disclosures on there, so they really haven't told us exactly what companies are coming in, but I, I know that a lot of these companies are posturing themselves to try to find land in Marshall County, flat land if it's available, so that they can do whatever they do with downstream industries that was re result uh, from that cracker plant. It would be certainly, uh, you know, I think um, uh, something that Marshall County would want to take advantage of. But another thing that really, you know, your predecessor talked about a lot was let's make Marshall County more accessible. Let's try to bring I-68 through Marshall County and a lot of talk about that. And as, as, a, as a county, you know, maybe there's only so much you can do about that. But, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, with, with regard to I-68, this has been an ongoing topic for over 20 years now. And there were several uh, routes, I think, that, uh, that they had talked about. In fact, one of the best routes, I think, they said was to go through New Martinsville for I-68. But in terms of I-68, um, if, if you can convince the Trump administration, the federal government to pony up 80%, you know, I, I would work uh, hard to get to 20% from the state, okay, to do it that way. But if the counties have, have anything to do with any, any payment with regard to that and paying for that particular road, no. Counties, um, counties are not in the road building uh, business. They're not in the road maintenance business. And um, I would not be for it for that that reason, if it was if it was count, you know, up to the counties. Yeah, it just you know, it is tough when you have to come up with money for something that you really aren't going to have control over. <laughs> That's the exactly. tough part. Um, you know, what's your biggest uh, hope or goal for being on the commission? You have any thoughts on things you want to try to? You know, trying to get uh, you know uh, 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 water and sewer lines, you know, to to the county. Obviously, broadband, you know, is is another issue that we would like to do. Uh, try to to make sure that uh, you know our residents are safe. Um, you know, with the influx of uh, oil and gas people, people look at them as maybe bad guys and that, and, you know, maybe there are a few you know, bad players there, but, uh, you know, just to try to keep our, our residents safe and uh, to keep Marshall County prospering and to do the absolute best we, we can for the, for the uh, residents of Marshall County. Well, I certainly wish you luck with it. Uh, appreciate you being here on the show and uh, explain to our viewers some of the things that are happening statewide and in the county, and uh, good luck with it all. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thanks all for right. what you do. We need to take a break. When we come back, I'll be talking sports. Stay with us here on the Jamie Bordas Show. People in nursing homes are some of the most vulnerable members of our society. They're there because they can't take care of themselves. Those facilities have a duty to take care of our loved ones. And when they don't, it's important they're held accountable. We've not only collected record results against negligent nursing homes, but more importantly, we've helped so many families get the answers and closure they so badly needed. Bordas and Bordas, fighting for justice. Welcome back to the show. It's time to talk sports and we will start in Pittsburgh with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Been following the Steelers for a number of weeks now with the talks about Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell and some developing news this week. The Steelers have announced that they will seek a trade for Antonio Brown. Uh, may not ne necessarily happen for sure, but they're going to listen to offers for Antonio Brown. They're saying they expect to get full value for him, that they won't trade him unless they get full value. But it sounds like Antonio Brown's days in Pittsburgh are probably over. I think there'll be a number of offers for his services. You know, you, look, the first guy in NFL history to do certain things, you know, gets a lot of attention. And, and he's certainly done that. And he's still, you know, only 31 years old, explosive player. Yeah, teams know they'll be getting a little bit of maybe some antics, for lack of a better word, with Antonio Brown. But it just seems like maybe, you know, it's run its course in Pittsburgh. And I hate to see that. I think the team should have found a way to keep him happy, but they didn't do that. So they will be exploring a trade now for Antonio Brown. And the Steelers also announced they will not place the transition tag, the franchise transition tag, on Le'Veon Bell. What that means is that under the transition tag, 
they would have a right of first refusal to match any offer that another team would make for Bell in free agency. The Steelers have said they're not going to do that. Uh, they feel like they're comfortable with James Conner and Jalen Samuels. So they are going to move on rather than another year of uncertainty and funds being tied up um, with respect to these players. So the Steelers will get a compensatory draft pick uh, if they lose Le'Veon Bell, which they will. And uh, sometimes those could be, you know, up to a third round pick, something like that. Uh, so they will get something in return for losing him. But uh, what the Steelers are really losing are two very dynamic players in Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell that were really cornerstones of, of the franchise. You know, people thought for at least another five years maybe uh, to even six, seven years. Uh, but now uh, they'll have to kind of start over. You know, there are some pieces in place. You know, of course, as I mentioned, Connor Samuels at running back, Juju Smith-Schuster certainly uh, looks to be a very promising wide receiver, had a great year, took Antonio Brown's place in the Pro Bowl. But, you know, who's opposite him? Uh, Steelers are going to have to look at now maybe bringing a receiver in. Uh, they definitely need some help at linebacker, defensive back. So there's some off-season work that's going to need to be done by the Pittsburgh Steelers with respect to free agency and the draft. Steelers aren't a team that have really done a lot in free agency in, in, their, in their history. Usually they like to build the team through the draft, but I think this is an instance where they're going to have to go out and maybe get some guys in free agency. Uh, let's turn to basketball. NBA All-Star game I talked about last week, and uh, as it turns out, just as I thought, Team LeBron won. Kevin Durant, the, the MVP, and uh, was just really impressive as he always is, but I'm just not sure I like this new format of letting players pick the teams. I like the old traditional East versus West. Uh, you got it, it makes it interesting. You got Steph Curry versus going versus uh, Kevin Durant and Clay Thompson, who are his teammates, not on opposite teams in the All Star game. But I just don't like this idea of players picking the teams and, and things like that. I'd like to see it the traditional way. Uh, college basketball: Duke's uh, Zion Williamson injured, you know, this week in the game against North Carolina early in the game and. Uh, you know, I want to mention because I think it's just another way that colleges have strangleholds on these players. You know, we don't make other students go to college. If a, if a kid comes out of high school, we could say he can go, you know, into the trades. He can go to the military. But if you're a good basketball player, you have to go to college. You have for at least one year. You can't go to the NBA. And here's a guy who was NBA ready, who could have done great things and signed a big contract, and now he risks injury because you make him go to college for at least a year. I, I just don't like it. These players already don't benefit uh, in a lot of ways. They don't, you know, they're not able to have jobs, they're able to earn money while they're in college. Now they risk injury too. I'm just not a big fan of it. I uh, also want to mention a change, another change with golf this week. Uh, this week is the first time that players are allowed to start wearing shorts in professional golf. So this week's World Golf Championship in Mexico, good place to start that down in Mexico where it's nice and warm. Uh, we'll see that rule change for the first time. So if you see players wearing shorts, you think something looks strange. That's what it is, but that's part of the new rules in addition to now being able to putt with the flag stick in that we saw talked about a couple weeks ago. That's all the time we have this week. I appreciate you joining in. Thanks to Mike Farrow for being here. We'll see you again next time on the Jamie Bordas Show.